Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining me so numerous. Uh, me and our speaker, Professor Samir Akash, who is in Australia, in Adelaide, and where it's very early in the morning. Um, so thank you very much for uh, uh, rising so, so quickly. And that is why we moved the seminar from six to seven o'clock here to give Professor Akash the chance to, to get a coffee. <laughs> thank you for rising so early. We are pleased, we're very pleased to have you here. Um, Professor Akash is Professor of Architectural History and Theory and Founding Director of the Centre for Asian and Middle Eastern Architecture at the University of Adelaide and uh, he's also a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities. His main areas of expertise are in the fields of Islamic art and architecture, Islamic mysticism and Islamic intellectual history and his uh, interdisciplinary research interests extend to also the social, urban and cultural history of the Levant and the history of Islamic science in the early modern period. His works received several national and international prizes and have been translated to several languages. His major publications include 10 books, and the most recent research project has just come out, published by Brill, uh, Nadar, Vision, Belief and Perception in Islamic Cultures. Um, and indeed, continuing with the RESIA aim at presenting work in progress or work recently completed, the focus of this seminar is Nadar, the question of vision in Islamic art and architecture. Professor Akash has kindly agreed to take questions, so please do write your questions or comments in the chat and I will post them to him at the end of the talk. Thank you, uh, Professor Akash, and over to you. I hope, <clears throat> I hope you can hear me. Uh, thanks, um, um, Anna, for the uh, uh, kind introductions and uh, for the invitation to contribute to this uh, um, uh, this fantastic series on Islamic art. I hope um, uh, you can hear me well. Um, yes. Yeah. I'll I'll start by sharing my uh, uh, my PowerPoint and then I will continue. So just give me a second. <clears throat> So um, now I hope that you guys can uh, can um, see the image. Yes, we can. Yep. Perfect. Um, well, uh, good evening to the to all the audience, including friends and colleagues. I can see many um, uh, of you from the northern hemisphere, and uh, good morning to the early risers from down under. It's a big challenge to wake up early in the morning. Thank you all for joining my presentation. Um, as Anna uh, uh, mentioned, the um, the focus um, the uh, the focus of my talk um, is my recently published book on the concept of nazar, uh, which is vision in Arabic, which I haven't actually seen yet in physical form, but I know that it is on its way. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the authors, um, some of whom are present with us here. Um, for their valuable contribution. It was absolute pleasure to work with you all. I have learned a great deal uh, from your expertise and insight. Um, I, will, uh, I will share um, a, a table of content uh, so that you can get an idea um, about the topics and the, uh, the thematic structure and coverage. Um, however, my aim in this talk uh, is not to introduce uh, the chapters or present a summary of the content, um, but rather to reflect on some of the key issues that are larger in their scope and implication than the book itself. 
these issues live with the author or editor, as many of you know, um, and find uh, continuous exposure in many occasion until they, uh, they are eventually overtaken by new occupations. Um, this seminar is the first occasion to reflect on those issues outside the frame of the book itself. So some of the stuff that, uh, that will be there um, um, is not really in the book. Um, um, before I start, I would, uh, I would like to add to um, um, Anna's um, introduction that, uh, uh, that I am an architect by um, educational and professional training. Um, yet one who is more idea oriented rather than object oriented. Architects, even though they deal with objects, um, somehow I grew out of this. I see myself as an intellectual historian rather than an art historian, um, even though that I um, have written extensively on art and architecture. And having worked closely with, um, um, and for a long time with Asian art curators in the Art Gallery of South Australia, which houses the only permanent Islamic art display in Australia, I have come to know only too well the complex problem involved in dealing with either objects or ideas um, or art history uh, and intellectual history, um, which have remained uh, disconnected in the field of Islamic art and architecture. I will, um, I have reflected actually on this, uh, um, um, on this disconnection in a recent short publication um, for those who might be interested in, uh, in, in seeing the, the, the sort of considering the relationship between um, uh, the two disciplines. Um, the, the insight in this article emerged from my recent work um, on the history of Islamic science. So um, I will start by uh, raising uh, two questions. Why the question of vision in Islamic art now, or Islamic art and architecture now, and why Nazar, um, which is really the essence of the book. By the way, I just wanted to actually make some, some passing comment. I've been using in, in throughout the presentation, the work of contemporary um, Moroccan artist, uh, um, uh, Lala Essaidi, um, which I actually not part of the book and it's not featured in the book. And I don't know, Lala, I'm not promoting her work. It just, I found her um, artwork um, very compelling and is very uh, relevant to the issue of vision. So I'm just using it as a visual device. So um, regarding those two questions, um, the first, uh, the two, to answer this question, the two sides to it, there is a side which represented by the, those two books that have been published recently, um, Alam, Science, Religion, and Art in Islam, was published in 2019, and then Nazar as Vision, Belief, and Perceptions um, um, in Islamic Cultures. And those represent in um, uh, what I would, um, would call uh, fabrics of thought in Islamic cultures. You know, as intellectual historians, I've been very much concerned with the, with, with, with these sort of the intellectual fabrics that uh, that lead to the production of work, and uh, and fabrics of thought have not actually received um, um, due attentions, and particularly focusing on key vocabulary that played important role in the um, sort of intellectual constructions um, um, of how mode of thought has been. Um, Sort of presented and um, um, uh, disseminated throughout the world. So that's the first aspect. The second aspect that relates to my um, um, why why Nazar in particular um, is the uh, really the, the publications of Hans Belting's book uh, Florence and Baghdad Renaissance Art and Arab Science. And many of you actually know it's a it's a controversial book that has. Uh, received many criticisms from art historian, and and it sparked in me when since it it, it was um, um, published, it sparked in me an interest in the nature of perception. Um, because I think, in my opinion, um, Belding's got it all wrong, um, um, and you can actually see his not from the art historical perspective. You can see the problematics from the history of science. In fact, uh, um, so. Uh, 
the widely criticized by Islamic art historian for methodological issue, but not as far as I know, um, uh, for the way that it intertwined Islamic intellectual history with art history, uh, nor for the neo-Eurocentric position it espoused, um, which can only be revealed from the perspective of the history of science. I've reflected on this in that short article that I referred to earlier. I will return to belting um, uh, later on, but um, with reference to those two um, aspects, I would say that, uh, I would actually say that the um, um, today's talk will be divided into those two issues, like the fabrics of thought, uh, or the sort of, that is the, at the heart of my, of my interest, and the nature of perceptions. Uh, so the first half <clears throat> will be very much a kind of a literary focus, it's based on literature, and it will deal with the issue of the gaze versus nother. Nother is vision, and the gaze has been the theoretical tool that has been used by art historian, and perception versus idrak. And um, idrak is the Arabic word for perceptions, um, uh, and much more in Arabic. So the first half will dwell on fabrics of thought, and the second half of the uh, of the talk will dwell on nature of perce perception, where I wanted to um, discuss um, a perspectival realism presented by um, uh, Belting uh, versus the pleasure of wonderment. So let's start with the um, uh, with a bit of a background, um, uh, and this is beyond uh, my immediate concerns with the two aspects. Ever since the appearance of Hal Foster Vision Visuality and Martin Jay's uh, famous <clears throat> Martin Jay's famous um, um, essays, Scopic Regimes of Modernity in the Field of Art and of Art History in the ninety in the ninety in the eighties, actually last century, and. <clears throat> and earlier Lacan's influential works in psychoanalysis in the 70s, the act of seeing and being seen had retain, has attained wide popularity among scholars in many fields. Um, psychoanalysts, philosophers, historians, um, um, historians and social scientists have articulated a new theories and histories of the gaze to viewing it as a power laden, culturally constructed social practice enacted through modes of visual interaction and control. They have investigated the nature, politics, morality, and sociability of seeing, examining how seeing, knowing, and power are interrelated. Question concerning who is able to see what and in what context, what is made visible, and how, how subjectivity is constructed through vision, how privacy, communality, and visual, inter uh, visual intrusion are enacted and negotiated among, uh, among many others have been, uh, have been widely engaged. As a result, new insights have emerged <clears throat> on the nature and culture of seeing, opening up a new horizon of thinking for scholars and students um, um, of, uh, of many fields, including visual and media studies, <clears throat> as well as art and architecture. Those, those studies have converged at two central points. Uh, the first point is that, that seeing is a complex act that is <clears throat> culturally conditioned, cultivated and refined by learning social norm and moral value. Second, that ways of seeing um, have history uh, that can be traced um, uh, through a complex matrix of system of thought, religious beliefs, social practices, work of art, and science and technology. So um, let's focus now um, on, after this background, let's focus now on the, uh, um, on the notion of the gaze. Most Islamic art historians, including Belting and his critics, um, have dealt with the issue of vision and visuality in Islamic cultures. <coughs> uh, they have used the gaze and visual perceptions as key analytical terms, assuming that they describe human sensory and mental functions that are universally <coughs> that are universal in nature. While it is true that we all see and perceive uh, in the same way mechanically, 
and it is justifiable to analyze the human visual experience in these universal terms. This approach um, tends to ignore the specific fabrics of thought that underlies um, the culture of vision. Um, from my perspective, um, I see that fabrics and um, fabrics of thought are woven by language. Um, I could be wrong, but this is really my, uh, uh, my stance in this particular position. Hence, the question of vision in Islamic art and architecture must be anchored in culturally specific and meaningful vocabulary. Uh, let's not forget that the gaze um, is a term, <coughs> um, is a term that, um, that emerged in the 70s in film theory and criticism and uh, referred primarily to how viewers engage with visual media. That is how we look at visual representation, such as advertisement, television program, and cinema. Uh, generally, the gaze uh, can simply mean just looking and seeing. Um, that's in, 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 in general terms. Um, <laughs> But and more specifically, it refers to the role of seeing and visual perceptions in self-awareness and awareness of otherness and the intimate relationship between desire and, um, and reality. So if we, are, um, if we are to start looking at fabrics of thought and looking at the way that the whole concept of vision being constructed in uh, pre-modern and even modern Arabic literature, um, we have to sort of make some kind of a, um, a scanning of what, uh, what terms that have been used. Uh, anyone who's familiar with the fine grain of Arabic can immediately recognize a wide spectrum of terms associated with vision. I'll select it, um, a set here, um, which is nazar, basar, basira, ru'ya, ru'ya, tarf, lahs, mushahada, kashf, tajalli. This is just a, a sort of a selected um, 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 spectrum. And the question then emerges um, as where is the gaze located in this spectrum? If we are to use the, ga the gaze as a universal device to, to, uh, to analyze vision and visuality in, in Islam, then how we can map it over this linguistic uh, linguistic structure, or what I call the fabrics of thought, that is based on this uh, on this set of vocabulary. If we consider, <coughs> uh, if we consider the lexical definition of the gaze, which is to look steadily and intently, especially in admiration, surprise, and thought, yet another Arabic term emerges, which is different to the one that I've actually just listed, which. Then you are talking about tahdiq, uh, from hadaqa, uh, from haddaqa to stare, and <clears throat> hadaqa, which is the, the iris. So we can actually see that despite all that spectrum, you still have other terms to deal with the concept of the gaze. Now, those issues have never been, as far as I'm concerned, been really um, um, examined by uh, an art historian who discussed the issue of the gaze. Um, in this spectrum, the three interrelated terms are fundamental for the understanding of vision and mode of seeing in the Arabic speaking world. Those, those terms are Quranic terms and used extensively in the literature. They are nazar, basar, and ru'ya. Um, if we are to um, analyze what do they mean or how do they what do they represent in the in the uh, in the process of vision nazar identifies the act the act of seeing basar identifies the medium which is the sense and ru'ya identifies the outcome so by using the gaze um, we are um, in fact reducing the complexity of those three terms which could not actually be um, taken separately into a single term that we're assuming that this is will cover um, uh, the way that uh, uh, Muslim scholars um, or even artists have understood or worked with the notion of vision. So let's uh, quickly look at what uh, 
um, what nazars mean um, in in general term nazars mean vision sight and gazing and this is the one that I call you know um, um, overlap was the meaning of the gaze it also means reasoning thought and reflections and ahlul ahlul nazar or ashabun nazar um, the folks of reflections of people of reasons were the philosophers and theologians in medieval literature. This is a technical term that consistently be used throughout the uh, um, um, pre-modern uh, period. If we look at the contemporary um, usages, we've got nazariya, uh, which is theory, munazara, which is a formal debate, manzur, which is perspective, and manzara, that's a med medieval term, but it's still being used, which is the mirador, uh, it's a, the, the viewing platform. And then tanzir. Tanzir is theorizing and theorizations. But at the same time, tanzir is a medical visualization of the body's interior, like endoscopy and colonoscopy. This is also used by the word tanzir, which is derived from, um, from Nazar. The most important aspect um, of uh, the use of nazar is this particular aspect, which is ahkam al nazar. Ahkam al nazar is the rules concerning seeing. And this particular um, medieval discourse um, that, um, that emerged in medieval, but to continue um, uh, to this day, is actually um, dictates visual practices and influence social life uh, in Islamic society. It's such an influential aspect of thinking about nazar that that does not come into the, the spectrum of um, what art historian um, deal with because it's being considered as more of the religious matters. But Ahkam and Nazar actually is so fundamental to everything that uh, um, um, related to uh, um, um, to issue of vision. And I've, in, in the book, Mike, I have a separate chapter on Ahkam and Nazar. So let's uh, let's dig a little bit deeper uh, into the fabrics of thought and look at some of the medieval um, or early um, Arabic literature. I'm referring here particularly to the to work of the um, celebrated um, literary scholars Abu Hilal al Askari. It's a 10th century um, a scholar um, who have um, has a, several books. One of the uh, the interesting one is called Al Furuq al Lughawiya, which is a linguistic dissimilarity. Um, in this particular um, uh, book, Al-Askari um, focuses on the semantic differences between terms with overlapping meaning. Um, try to sort of clarify the, some of the confusions or the misunderstanding in using the term. So um, he looked at Nazar extensively and in, in the book, we can actually see the differentiation between Nazar and Ta'amwar. Um, we can see the difference between nazar and ru'ya, uh, nazar and ta'amun looking and contemplating, nazar and ru'ya looking and seeing, nazar and istidlal, reasoning and deductions, uh, nazar and badiha, reasoning and intuition, uh, badiha and ru'ya, intuition and seeing, nazar and fikr, uh, reflections and thinking, nazar and intizar, reflections and expectations, and then nazar and khatir, which is reflections and roaming thought. So, so obviously the, the word or the concept of nazar extend to a much wider spectrum of thought that has been part of what I um, have been calling the fabrics of thought in, uh, in pre-modern Islamic cultures. Um, Al-Askaris provide valuable insight into the relationship not only between seeing and thinking, but also between seeing and perceptions. When we get to the, to the way that Al-Askari um, defines uh, Nazar in particular, we will find that, um, we will find that he, he refers to Nazar as seeking to reach. Um, I think through either vision or, um, or, or thought. So if we if if we use the, uh, the, the 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 exact Arabic word that he actually used is talabu idraku, or talabu idrak is shayi min jihat al basar aw al fikr. This means that it is uh, uh, so al idrak, which is perception, um, um, 
I'm not going to use it because I could translate this as uh, seeking to perceive, but I don't want to use the to seeking to perceive because then I immediately fall in the trap of, of equating idrak with perception. But the actual meaning of idrak is actually reaching. So reaching a thing through either vision or, um, or thought. He also um, referred to, to another as seeking the appearance or manifestation of form. So, so it is not direct seeing, but it's actually the initial act which is seeing. That is why it has that three, um, uh, a three-sided um, uh, aspect, which is another basar and ru'ya. Furthermore, um, if we look at the way that he deals with um, 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 with, with idrak, idrak from the verbal arud daraka or adraka to reach reveals an understanding of perception as a process and endeavor towards an end, which is um, not restricted to senses. Uh, once fulfilled, one reaches a state of awareness, which is idrak, uh, through a singular or multiple means. So it could be sensory, it could be intellective, it could be revelatory. Um, and, and that is why in, in Arabic, both perceptions and comprehensions are referred to by the same word, idrak. And this is where the confusion gets uh, um, 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 when we restrict perceptions to, um, uh, to idrak, which is mainly the sensory aspect of understanding. So uh, by, uh, by conceptualizing, uh, by conceptualizing Nazar as an act of seeking, uh, so it's not seeing, it's an act of seeking. Um, um, Alaskari offers an interpretive scope that allows Nazar to be understood in visual terms as an act or function of the eye, in cognitive terms as an act or function of the mind, and in spiritual terms as an act or function of the heart. So while, it, as a result of this, while perceptions narrows the scope of a human engagement um, with the world to the senses, Idrak opens it up beyond the senses. This is a very fundamental difference from my perspective when we consider fabrics of thought. We could not actually just use um, sort of generalized terminology and ignore the way that certain aspects is being thought about and written about and engaged and dealt with in, uh, in medieval Islamic literature. And I'm using Arabic only, I know that's a limitation. Uh, this is my um, um, mother tongue, uh, um, I'm native speaker. Um, but of course, when you take um, Ottomans and Persians and Urdu into account, things get even more complex. Um, just to quickly here, before I move to the second part, because we, I think we get, we're getting um, um, sort of halfway now, uh, I just want to refer to certain um, usages of the three terms by um, uh, um, by a Sufi and, and by a scientist and by a uh, Hadith scholar. So that would actually give an idea of how those three terms features in the, uh, um, in the fabrics of thought of, of different uh, group of people in the Islamic world. So um, if we look at Ibn Arabi's uh, quote here, which is, you can actually see that the Ru'ya, uh, Nazar uh, and Basar are related in certain ways. And the, the important bit here is that the basar um, is considered the divine essence of the whole a practice of seeing. Uh, so you have not seen other than a form determined by your side, which is another, uh, with a vision that is the real. So the vision, the, the essence or the divine essence of the whole process of seeing is really basar in this regard, not another but Nazar plays an important role in determining the external form. Now, if we look um, uh, at um, a very famous book, which is Kitab Al-Manazir by uh, uh, Ibn al-Haysam, um, Ibn al-Haysam does not deal with Nazar in the content of the book, like in throughout the book, he deals with Basar, and he uses Basar um, as the, um, um, the aspect of vision that is being scientifically analyzed because it is the, the kind of universal aspect of the, and But he calls the book Manazir, which is from Nazar. Manazir is, uh, uh, is a plural of Manzur, which is the seen 
and scenes, and hence it's in relation to the concept of uh, or the notion of perspective. So, but throughout through 13th century Latin translations of the book, it has become known as the book of optics. And the book of optics is the study of the of light. Now, um, uh, Ibn al Haysan never called it the study of light. He 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 specifically and and whoever actually um, uh, read Ibn al Haysan know how specific he is. He called it al-Manazir because he's concerned with the issue of nazar. And in fact, optics from the original original Greek term optos, which actually seen seen. So he's being quite faithful to the original meaning. But in the meantime, it has been transferred into uh, a book of optics that deals with the study of light, which is really not the intended meaning. So um, so that's. Um, that's the second one. The third one, which is really important, that comes from Hadith scholars um, and uses the, the uh, focuses on Al Idrak. And Hadith scholars is Ibn al Arabi and it came from Al Qabat fi Sharah Muqta Malik ibn Anas. So he actually, in a Hadith book that, that came, he said Al Idrak, and here he refers Al Idrak not to comprehension, mental comprehension, but to visual perception. He said, is a meaning that God creates in the eye according to what the viewer intends to see of the visible thing. So, uh, so here is, this is really a whole big twist, where is the uh, uh, visual perception uh, is a meaning that emerges in the eye. It doesn't emerge in the mind, it emerges in the eye and with, through the, the divine intervention. And intentionality plays a very important role in how you present or you, you see or you perceive or you want it to represent the uh, um, uh, external world. So let's move now quickly into the implication of all this um, before we move into the second uh, section of the talk. Uh, first, introducing the stage of seeking to see um, breaks the immediacy of visual perceptions, allowing for the intervention of cognitive, imaginative, and revelatory processes to be part of idrak. Uh, one call it perception, call it comprehension, just call it idrak, part of idrak, which involves a scope of comprehension much wider than perception. So that's the first um, uh, implication that is important for the study of vision and visuality. Then second, seeking the appearance. Uh, this is important. Now, uh, when we seek the appearance, it, you're not dealing on the sort of subject object relationship. The appearance could actually change because you're seeking certain appearances. Um, uh, same object could actually appear in, 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 in different ways to your eyes. So seeking the appearance, of things give both the viewing subject, nausea, and the object of vision, manzur, active agencies in the act of seeing, while playing down the instinctive nature and objective autonomy of the process of visual perception. Third, the effective agency of the viewer and the malleability of um, visible reality provide a scope uh, for the extraordinary, the unpredictable, and the unknowable to emerge. Uh, those things are not really part of the spectrum of gaze, and that is why Nazar, um, through Nazar, I'm trying to open up a horizon of thinking about vision and visuality in the Islamic world that is quite different to the, uh, to the conventional approach. So, um, Nazar, uh, finally, so Nazar and Idrak allows for the possibilities of divine interventions and the perceptive process, as well as, um, as, well as of one reality or, or object to appear in different forms, so as to be seen differently by the same or different viewer. Uh, I think this is, from my perspective, quite fundamental. And in, this, in the context of this fabric of thought, and associated modes of understanding the scope of the gaze that has been so pervasively used uh, present limited intersections with the scope of Nazar. Um, those aspects, those reflections, in fact, are not really part of the book. This is now, uh, it's an occasion for me to reflect on it. But sometimes you present things, certain things on a, of the book, but then you, you come back and reflect on them in a, in a different manner. So, um, Let's move now, um, having first, uh, uh, completed the first part, let's move now to the um, 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 to nature of perception and perspectival realism versus uh, pleasure of wonderment. Um, here, um, I wanted to, uh, to start by um, uh, referring to this particular painting. 
this is um, one of my favorite Persian paintings because it, it brings architecture and art together in a, in a marvelous way. And it is called The Seductions of Yusuf uh, by famous Persian artist Kamal, uh, Kamal al-Din Behzad. It's a 16th century painting featured in the Persian uh, poet Jami's classic work of, uh, work of literature, uh, Haft uh, Orang. Uh, while we're looking at this, I would like you to consider three things that we, we refer to, um, um, or that comes from um, medieval, uh, pre-modern pre um, Islamic literature. The, the first one is Nazar being the quick, this is how it's actually defined also by the Al-Askari. And it's not just by the Al-Askari, this is actually I found it in so many um, references, is the quick turning of the eye. Taqlibul Ain. Uh, this is really important. Taqlibul Ain. It's the quick turning of the eye while facing the scene, seeking to see it. Uh, so that's the first one. The second one, we've, we've already uh, looked at it as a seeking talab uh, to reach a thing through either vision or thought. So there is a kind of interaction between the, uh, the sensory and the, and the intellective aspect. And then um, Idrak as a meaning that, that God... Um, um, creates in the eye um, according to what the viewer intends to see of the visible zone. Once you actually consider those three and then look at this, um, it starts to actually appear in a, in a different way. The depictions, this depiction arouses a sense of wonder through the unfamiliar juxtaposition of familiar architectural elements. Unfamiliarity is invoked through the constructed spatial composition that defy perspectival logic and visual realism. The architecture is recognizable, yet the scene is widely different from what we know, perceive, and experience. The painting conveys a spatial perception um, um, of a, of a multi-level, uh, multifaceted structure of folded, uh, uh, folded walls, ornamented surfaces, uh, flying stair uh, stairways, disconnected towers, um, uh, conical roofs, a fence, a balcony, and several shut doors and windows, all flattened for simultaneous viewing. Um, this constructed simultaneity mobilizes the viewer's eyes and takes it um, on a curious spatial journey of intrigue, mystery, and discovery, while challenging their mind um, to make sense of it, of what they see, and to restore imaginative normality to the scene um, in familiar terms. Um, this, you know, this type of presentation has led to a number of questions. Why um, do pre-modern um, Islamic paintings look flat and unreal? Why um, do they lack spatial depth, uh, basic visual logic, and sense of natural realism? Um, why um, do they not involve perspectival naturalism? I mean, these are the questions that Belting has sort of uh, grappled with. So, uh, um, um, so that is why it is important for me when, when I consider the nature of a perception to refer to belting. Um, in response to those questions, there has been generally um, a three positions. There's a cultural difference, um, was it a matter of cultural difference, reflecting different ways of seeing expressions of um, uh, expression and drawings, or was it a matter of cultural incapacity that impeded the intervention uh, or the invention of perspectival techniques and the development of naturalistic pictorial representation, or was it simply a matter of cultural preference, aesthetics or otherwise, for spatially fantastic and visually non-realistic representations um, um, enacted by Muslim artists, patrons, and audiences? Now, the, generally, the general position on this has been cultural difference, even though that the actual sort of, since there was a, you know, Muslim, uh, have perceived spatial depths and saw deployment of natural objects in the same way everybody else is. So, the, but the, the actual explanation of culture has never been convincing to me. Um, now, this gets a bit more complex. In fact, uh, that question when we when we consider that uh, um, that Muslims uh, have long established the practice of constructing viewing platforms uh, for panoptic gaze, known in Arabic as manzara, as referred to earlier uh, from nazar and Manzur perspective, Abbasid and Fatimid Caliphs uh, built a numerous manazir, manazir, which is the, uh, the mirador, uh, to overlook beautiful landscape, marketplaces, urban spaces, and even battlefields. Um, these devices 
architectural devices were also um, uh, used for visual display of power at significant religious ceremonies. Yet never have these gazing practices being captured artistically with a sense of naturalism. And this is one in the, in the end of us, Manzar uh, al um, Here, I would like to actually just refer to, um, um, to some kind of give part explanations of that pre-modern sources, what pre-modern sources suggest is that the drawing natural scene as they appear carried little value for Muslim, prompting us to question why would anyone want to represent what is always visually available? Um, what is the value of such mimetic practices? Um, the way in which um, um, uh, Muslim drew and reflected on the value of the uh, visual experience suggests so that their sense of difference reflect the theorizing preference. This can be seen in that in, in al -Qazwini, who whose whole book really was structured around the concept of nazar even this you know even the structure of the of the book was uh, referred to as first nazar second nazar third third nazar so so the nazar was really um um uh, ingrained in the way that he thinks about his visual representation here is a, a quote from uh, fr uh, from the opening introductions um by al tadwini he said whosoever cannot see of the sky other than its blueness and of the earth other than its dustiness, he is sharing with the beast this visual experience. Um, his state is even lower than the beast and his forget forgetfulness is worse. As God says, they have hearts with which they do not understand. And goes on until he says, those are like the beast. Nay, they are even more astray. What is meant by Nazar, this particular uh, vision, uh, here is the simultaneous reflections on the on intelligible realities, maqulat, while looking at the sensible reality, mahsusat, and the search for their wisdom and mode of existence so that their truthfulness may appear unto the observer. Remember, we talked about al-idrak as being seeking the appearance of things. So here's actually the kind of corollary of this where he says, so that their truthfulness may appear unto the observer. So it's not like the static form of the object, but it's the truthfulness of the, of the object that, that can appear in certain circumstances. And these are the ones that, that's being sought. For this is the cause of worldly pleasure and eternal happiness. Now, um, uh, quickly um, here, um, uh, building um, is, of course, uh, upheld the, um, the argument of cultural incapacity, he considered that although the Muslims have actually worked out the mathematical principle of, of perspective, that they were incapable of such revolutionary invention due to various religious inhibitions and intellectual um, uh, constraint. Um, so although, um, so although um, Belting's, um, uh, Belting theory, um, of, um, of cultural incapacity is not widely shared. Some attempt to argue for cultural difference by explaining the uniqueness of Islamic ways of seeing have inadvertently played into um, belting neo Eurocentric stance. Islamic, um, is, um, Islamic landscape historian um, Fairchild Ruggles, for example, has analyzed the visual construction of another painting of Hap Oring to show the fundamental difference between the European and Islamic mode of seeing. This is the, uh, the painting that she referred to as the article Making Vision Manifest. Um, unfortunately, Ragel adopted and critically the gaze proposition. Um, she argues that the uh, perceived spatial depths created by lines converging at a vanishing point brings the viewer into the same um, uh, fictive visual field of the canvas. This is really, this is belting argument. Uh, the visual perceptions of space receding from, uh, let me just sort of give you an example of that. Um, the visual perception of space receding from the viewer and projecting outward towards him, generating a sense of depth naturally draws the viewer to the plane on which the picture is traced, technically known as the picture plane. She argues that uh, uh, the Muslim flattening technique, she argues, extract the viewer from the picture, 
from the picture plane and position them on the outside where they deliberately uh, stay immobilized and dissociated from the scene. Now, I think this is my view, and you can, you can criticize me on this. I think the whole situation is the reverse. Um, it's, it is not that the, uh, the, the Islamic painting uh, immobilizes the viewer and the other one who brings it into the picture is the other way around. So let's, let's, look, at, let's look at it technically, at least. Um, technically, the, uh, this argument is technically incorrect in my view. Uh, in perspective drawing, the stationary eye of the viewer lying at the apex of the cone of vision is always outside the picture plane. The picture plane here is in this picture is the middle uh, a gridded um, um, glass panel. Um, the gazing point can never be in the picture plane because it will fall on the horizon line or vanishing point, and this will flatten the image, eliminating the illusory sense of depth uh, created by the conversion lines extending from the eye uh, to the vanishing point. The illusion of depth uh, reflects the distance between the viewing um, uh, subject and the viewed object. Thus, the picture plane must be kept at a practical distance from the viewing point to capture the object of vision with minimal distortion. So um, the subject-object polarity, which keeps the, the spatially positioned viewer out of the scene, is the very essence of perspectival representation. Um, and I think this is where uh, sort of Regal got it wrong. So by contrast, the flattening, by contrast, the flattening, um, 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 Flattening the image removes the necessary distancing of the, uh, of the viewer's eyes from the picture plane, uh, as we could see actually in this, um, uh, bringing it in and conflating it um, with the image. Uh, the conflation puts the eye in motion, uh, as there is no one privileged and static point from which the composition is to be, is to be seen, and that is why they, the Muslim referred to the act of seeing as taqlibul ayn. And this whole issues of you know, peripheral visions and the movement of the eye has now only recently come into sort of understanding of how perspective um, was, uh, was inadequate in their representation of spaces. So, um, um, so accordingly, Islamic painting drags the view of vision and imagination into the heart of the scene and engages them in a dynamic relationship with the elements um, uh, with the element of the deliberately estranged composition. It is this estrangement of the familiar that draws the viewer into the picture, inviting them to join the painter in an imaginative journey of discovery and understanding, or as al Tazwini puts it, of simultaneous reflections and search for wisdom concealed in what appears. For this is the cause of worldly pleasure and eternal happiness. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Akash, for this very um, rich and multi-layered talk uh, on a very, you know, difficult subject. Um, lots of food for thought, and I hope that um, please write in the chat your points or your questions. Um, this question of, of perspective uh, or flat vision, I don't like the word flat for, for, me, for paintings, for Arab or Persian or Turkish paintings at all. I think that it's not flat at all and that, you know, we rather have to think of them as um, uh, images that represent multiple points of view um, and they are very complex in fact and I think that you know this this focal point of the renaissance um, is quite reductive in a way you know it's got its own ideas and its own merit so yes I, I agree with you that it's much more comp complex than that. Um, another think that uh, came to mind when when you were talking is this idea and you, you were showing um, a mirador in the Alhambra and you sort of talked a little bit about the outside and the inside so the vision that it's also inside and outside but and previously you talked about the 
concept of Tanzir, of the view of the interior, it, which includes also a view of the body inside. And I, I was wondering whether you could say something a bit more about that. I think, um, first of all, um, regarding the flattening, I agree with you. Um, the flattening is only a technical term to um, that had been used as um, in opposition to the to the perspectival spatial depth, uh, but that doesn't mean flattening. That is everything's in 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 sort of just a flat surface, but it does not have the sort of perspectival naturalisms of depth. Uh, it has multiple view, of course, and this is where the whole idea of the sort of bringing in the viewer. To, to share with the uh, sure. uh, with the painter or representer the whole idea of the multiple. That's why I refer to the idea of taqlib al ayn, which is the the quick turning of the eye. That is really important. Uh, so that's one thing. Now with with the with the mirador and the um, the tanzir. Tanzir is actually as a colonoscopy or endoscopy, they which is the interior. It's really modern terms. It's never been used in, in the, because they didn't actually have those techniques in the past. Uh, but it's interesting that it actually came from Mazar because it's the visualization that that, that matters. Uh, now, whether that actually resonates with, with some aspect of the Manzara, I think it, it, in a certain way it does because, because um, even though that you're actually looking in the outside, you're always on the inside. Um, uh, those visualizing platforms is always is always removed and is always sort of the people who actually viewing is uh, um, are on the inside, but their visualizing act is off the outside. Um, uh, and there are so many, I mean, Yaqut uh, al uh, al he described so many manzars which actually have a, um, um, a, an interesting way of sort of relating to the, to the inside and outside. But because Tanzir as the interior of the body is is uh, is a modern term. It's very hard to sort of compare to what what mode of sort of um, viewing that used to be in the past. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I was also thinking while I'm waiting for some comments in the chat. Please write your comments in the chat. Um, I was thinking because you showed uh, so many um, images of uh, Sadi with. Uh, that uses um, calligraphy, uh, elements of calligraphy, calligraphic, uh, you know, um, aspects in the in the and and you know the the importance of calligraphy in Islamic art and and you know whether how whether how does calligraphy sits in the act of uh, writing for a scribe? How does that sit within the discourse that you were uh, looking at? Um, well, I particularly uh, used um, uh, Lalit's actually paintings, uh, or the sort of contemporary, because it does use that kind of script. But it, she, she uses it, I mean, it's very powerful, um, the way that she uh, she wraps all the body with the, um, uh, or the object with the script. And, but for me, it's, uh, and one of the reasons why I selected them because they actually bring the whole idea of fabrics of thought, where the the uh, um, it, it is all about the language. Uh, but when I when I talk about the fabrics of thought about the language, I'm more interested in the actual in the actual semantics uh, rather than the visual appearance. But the visual appearance is so important, and that is why you know Lali's work. I think reflect that sensitivity is that uh, the, the sort of the visual expressions of the language and the scripts is as important as the semantics of the uh, of the meanings. Uh, but I have in my in my projects I'm um, more interested in the in the meanings and the semantics of you know it's key terms like for example knowledge, elm, and nazar vision, uh, which are which are sort of used universally in the Islamic, in the Islamic world, has never actually been the focus of research in themselves. They're kind of on the sideways, like, like you know, you can, you can talk about vision through the gaze, but you're not talking about vision, really, uh, as being a medium of thinking, as a, as a sort of a foundation of a particular fabric of thought that could reveal um, works of art in certain ways. And, you know, by looking at, by looking at, at, at the field in this way, we're not trapped in the sort of pre-modern and modern. And that is why I deliberately decided to use modern sort of visual 
um, devices to, to see that it is not really, it doesn't really matter. You can actually still be part of that fabric of thought in modern time. You don't actually have to worry about crossing the line between the modern and the, and the pre-modern because, because the word nazar is still being used now in, in many different ways. And ahkam al-nazar particularly, which is the most influential aspect of nazar on Muslim life, still, is still current, is still valid, and it's still very powerful. Um, um, so that is why um, I see it this way. So, uh, but I haven't actually sort of, you know, paid particular attention to the to the calligraphy itself as an expression of fabrics of thought. Thank you very much. We have some um, points in the chat. So there is Iliona Outra Mahalili that says, "Thank you for your interesting talk. Does Naza related to Islamic art?" relate to bringing the image into the beholder's subjective or inner space. I would like to relate your subject to my PhD study, which looks at how the Christian icon brings the image to a person's interior. Um, it's a complex question. And uh, um, I mean, the, the making, the, my, my point would be is the making of the image as I referred to, for example, the uh, seduction of Yusuf is, um, is part of that fabrics of thought. So you would think about, you know, the visual and uh, the visual field in certain ways. And I, and I always think that that, um, uh, that that is already part of your, you know, your mode of thinking. And that's why another is so important, because it brings it brings the act of seeing and the act of reflections. Um, together, and uh, which is which is not in in the word of uh, in any other word, it's not in the gaze. For example, when you think about the gaze, the gaze is entirely sensory and and uh, um, visual practice. It is it is not reflective in that. If you want to reflect on this, it becomes perceptions, and then you will talk about perception. Whereas mother allows you to actually think about the two together. So, so I would say might be not the right answer or might be sort of in the, um, uh, that I understood uh, well, but it, it is, of course, any image is part of that fabrics of thought before it becomes an image. Um, um, yeah. So, uh, um, and, and now whether that is sort of comparable to the way that the Christian uh, uh, thought about it, I would say, I wouldn't actually, because I think of fabrics of thought as being woven by language, I would like to see it within a linguistic framework rather than seeing it within a, a religious framework, like a you know a general um, a religious kind of a, a you know position. Say, oh, Christians would do this. Um, um, in in my analysis, I would like to say, okay, look, you know, those who would speak Latin, for example, would think about it this way, uh, or those who would, say, who would speak Greek would think about it this way. It could be Christian, it could be Muslim, but because they, the fabrics of thought are being woven by language, language is the medium of you of your externalizing your ideas and your thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, so um, um, here, here I'll show my limitation that I haven't actually ventured into Persians, uh, despite the fact that you know the uh, uh, Jami's work in, in in Persian and it would have been would have been useful to actually look at Nazar in Persian. For example, you can actually see the, how the fabrics are sort of actually it's dynamic. Like Nazar in Turkish, for example, uh, is is very much evolved to become now associated with the evil art, um, um, which is not the case in Arabic, and, and I don't think that the case in Persian. Um, but in Turkish, yes, it is. Nazar is now the evil eye. Um, um, so, uh, but historically, when you look at it in the in the literature, um, you you will see that how it actually evolved. And I particularly use earlier sources to get a sense of um, of how that term was uh, was considered um, by early Muslim before it actually started to you know to be documented in a modern way. Thank you. I don't know that that answers, but you know, it's, no, that's it's so partly my limitation. <laughs> Uh, Kathy Shahande, uh, does your idea of Nazar correspond with Hamid Nafisi's Islamicate gaze theory and the idea that in Islam this is largely predicated on the concept of veiling and averting the gaze, particularly in regards to women? Also, does this mean that in Islamic countries the gaze can never be fully translatable into the Western gaze theory 
and its implications, and that we do need this different rhetoric to reference this ideology. It is interesting well, to see that you chose Leila Saadi's photographs, as they also reflect this ideology and idea of gays, which is heavily predicated on the image of women. Um, can can you see the chat? You can. Go. I'm trying. I'm trying. It's a it's a long one. And okay, uh, so, I, I can, uh, let me. Uh, see, uh, this is Ka this is Kathy. This is Kathy. Kathy. Ah, Kathy. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, of course, what was Hamid um, um, Nafisi's uh, Islamic um, Gaithi? I haven't actually read that, so I, I can't uh, I can't comment on this. But uh, um, and the idea of Islam is uh, largely predicated on the concept of bailing um, and averting the gate. Look, I think if you, uh, um, I particularly refer to the to the Ahkam al Nazar. Um, and in the way that actually I discussed it in my, in my chapter in the book, which is all on Ahkam al Nazar, because the, uh, the whole idea of it, and actually my, um, my paper in there, my chapter is called Veiling. It, it does discuss the issue of Veiling, but I don't look at it in the conventional way. I actually look at it in a completely different way. So it's, I wouldn't actually say that, you know, I, I wouldn't actually reduce these, the whole Islamic culture into into the notion of veiling. It's far more complex than that, but veiling does play an important role. But if it does play an important role, it is because of the discourse of Ahkam al nazar There's no comparable legal genre of writings about Ahkam al nazar as far as I know, in other, in other um, um, societies where it actually dictates how, what you are allowed and not allowed to see uh, and, uh, and the moral principle that's based on this and how, for example, um, uh, men looks at men, women looks at women, men looks at women, uh, and women looks at men, and, and you know, um, various objects that you would look at. And there, there are certain, pres you know, um, um, prescriptive rules about this, and and this is in a way, in my opinion, is highly influential uh, and has been um, uh, ever since Ibn Al Qattan wrote his uh, his really critical book because it kept being uh, reproduced until this uh, this time and and. A lot of people abide, and the whole idea of veiling is is really constructed around ahkam um, al-nazar, um, um, which is the rules concerning seeing. It's a, what you are allowed to see and not to see, what you are allowed to expose and not to expose, and all that sort of stuff. So I would I would say only in that regard is yes. Um, I would say that this is an important part of Islamic world. But, but if you look at the Islamic world, it's so varied, even sort of in modern time. Not everybody actually sort of you know, uh, uphold the idea of veiling and, and or believe in the, in the issue of veiling, but but it is an influential. But because I'm looking at fabrics of thought, if I am to understand veiling, I want to understand it in the context of the of the way that's being conceptualized and articulated in the literature. And the best way to see it is through Akam and Mother. Uh, and Ahkam al-Nazar, as I said, um, uh, Islamic art historians don't normally look at it because they, it, it is too um, sort of religious related type of topics. And, uh, mm. um, but I believe it is, is an important fundamental in the, in the way that, that dictates visual practices. Sure. Okay, Sabri Hafez, uh, I would have liked to hear more about the position of the viewer in relation to both the picture and architecture. Do you think that the lack of perspective has to do with the accepted position of the viewer as a passive agent submitting to the sublime divine representation of either the Quranic story as in the case of Yusuf or the sublime architecture of the Alhambra? I... Um, look, thanks, Sabri. I think this is a, is a good question. I, I honestly think that it is, uh, I mean, you know, finding, finding historical um, explanations like what Belting has done as to, you know, all the sort of religious inhibitions or the, uh, um, the intellectual constraint that, like, you know, for example, I have a doubt that like, even Belting has actually read Al-Manazir in Arabic. Uh, he might actually have read it in... Uh, uh, in uh, um, um, in translations, 
Um, and even if he read it in Arabic, his Arabic must actually be very, very basic uh, because he did not really understand the fine grains of the Arabic and understood like you know, simple things. Like, for example, he says that, oh, the Arabs didn't actually have concept of space. They didn't actually have concept of the picture. And that's why he's trying to sort of build his argument around it. But I mean, if you, I can go through the text and show you how Ibn al is you know, fully aware of this thing. He might use different terminologies that the one that he's familiar with, but it is not really uh, the case. So, so I would, you know, trying to find, um, define those kind of justifications um, by why, for example, they are, didn't, didn't produce or invent the, uh, um, uh, the perspective in the same way why, you know, in the history of science, why did they invent the uh, heliocentric theory while they know the mathematics of it and all that sort of stuff. This is actually a neo-eurocentric position, which I explained it in my, in my, in my article. And, uh, and, you know, I don't think that you will find you know, satisfactory um, satisfactory kind of justifications because the, the, the historical suit is so complex that you cannot reduce it to sets of um, sort of interpretation say, ah, oh, because of this, they, you know, that's what happened. And uh, uh, generally I would say in my, from my position is that it's simply a cultural preferences and that, that they didn't actually see value in representing the world as, as it is because it's visually available. Why would you actually just reproduce it numerically? They were more interested in, in creating um, what, what I've actually focused on is the, the issue of seeking the appearance of things. You know, when I'm seeking the appearance, I didn't mean the appearance that, the appearance as a static form. It's something that emerges in that visual interaction. Um, and the, the uh, perspective actually deny that um, that possibility, because the, the perspective always assumed that the appearance is is there, and you can we can reproduce it exactly using the uh, perspectival mathematics or the geometry of, of the perspective. Whereas the the uh, from what I, from my reading and the fabrics of thought that are they're not interested in this. They're interested in the in the dynamic nature of what appears, because in certain circumstances, and this is related also to the concept of um, al-hal in Arabic, where, where you see things in certain situations, very situational, and sometimes things appears to you in certain way, other time appears to you in different ways. So they, the whole idea is to try to see the appearance that you are after. So for example, if you are after sort of the truthful thing or the meaning of the, then things start to appear and give you different meanings. So it's, you know, the static nature that, that the perspective has projected I think it's alien to the uh, uh, to the Islamic fabrics of thought, and there's no reason to try to justify why they did or did not do perspectives. I mean, it's I thought that's completely irrelevant, and I find it completely futile argument to try to find historical justification. It's just basically this is the way the culture played itself, or this is the civilization played itself, and there is merit in in whatever they they have presented, and I can actually see more beauty in the way that they have. I like, for example. Al Qazwini, the way they talked about Nazar throughout the book, was far more, you know, far more um, um, interesting to me as a as an intellectual historian than the images themselves or the way that the uh, um, the representations of the world works, because there is a certain sort of interest or or a certain idea, a certain way of thinking about the world that is it, it, it's quite operative and it it is not restricted by just particular sort of perspective of representation would tend to be static. Hmm. I don't know whether that answers the, uh, the question, sorry. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, it's very complex. Thank you. Uh, Samuel Amira, thank you for this wide ranging lecture and the book, which is great. Sos was a prompt purchaser. I, I mentioned that to you. Uh, there is much to say by writing comments rather the restricts dialogue. I know both Belding's book and Ruggles' article quite well, and yet I didn't recognize your accounts of them. Uh, does Belding really say the Muslims were culturally incapable of perspective? He has been rightly criticized for his historical errors, and like any book, it's imperfect, but it has always seemed to me, Pache, it's Islamic art historical critics, it is much more interesting than it has been represented by these critics. I'm glad to uh, find it, you too find it use, usefully provocative. Well, uh, look, I agree. I, I think it's a, 
it's a provocative book. I think I enjoyed reading it, in fact, and it, it has it made it provides a lot of information. But if you read my article um, um, on uh, um, neo Eurocentricity and science, if you look at it from the science perspective, because it does bring the history of science, and particularly if you look at it in together with other history of science, like, for example, um, the writings of Toby Huff, for example, then there is an emerging new position, which is, uh, which is now uh, which is now emerging, uh, trying to change the way that the that the authors account for European exceptionalism. Uh, now we know that European exceptionalism and the uh, um, and European superiority has already been there in the in the discourse of the Enlightenment. But you know, this discourse of the Enlightenment has been subject to um, uh, heavy criticism in postcolonial theories and postcolonialism and all that sort of. So that's collapsed in it. But now authors have, have come up with a new strategy, actually a far more robust strategy than what it used to be. And this strategy, which I call neo-Eurocentrism, is again trying to re-establish the um, um, re-establish European exceptionalism on the basis on the basis of creative adaptability. The argument in the past used to be, ah, oh, look, you know, there's no one else has done anything. You know, Europe has done everything. You know, that was, you know, they are the, you know, the rational, the inventive, the creative, and all that. So, um, the Arabs has only sort of been a, sort of a, a medium of connecting the, the or bringing the, the Greek knowledge into that. Now, Europeans have given up this because it's it's no longer actually valid. They don't believe in it themselves. But now they've come up with something else. They said, oh. You know, the Arab, the Chinese, and all the other tradition have done great work in medieval time. They're fantastic. They've done all that. They worked out everything, you know. But, you know, um, you know, it comes into um, early modern time. We, as a European, were so clever that we could actually take all those inventions and put them to new use and make something new of them. So Toby Huff would actually talks about, you know, and, and Joe Salibas and all those things about all the, you know, the, the inventions of the heliocentric system, Ibn Shara's inventions and all that sort of stuff uh, that it's all already been done by the, by the Arab. But of course, the Arab did not really put forward the heliocentric theory like uh, Copernicus and, and, uh, um, and Ibn al-Haysam worked out all the mathematics of perspective, but the Arab didn't actually, you know, come up with the, um, with the perspective. So they find this as a new strategy to reposition themselves or representing their superiority as being, as being um, um, so fundamental. It's inscribed in the DNA of the Western societies that, that it is now, it's quite clear that, okay, all the civilizations done, but they couldn't do what the European have done because they've taken all this and then made the new use out of it. So it become like the creative adaptability that matters and it is no longer the invention itself. It, they've adapted this. And I think this is a very fundamental neo-Eurocentric position. This is what I don't like about, uh, about um, um, belting, which, which has not been picked up by the art historian because the art historian did not actually look at it from the history of science. I looked at it from the history of science. And, and, uh, and then you can see the overlap with other historians of science and how this position started to represent itself in various fields among uh, pre, uh, early modern historians. And I think this is where um, it requires now a new narrative by the um, um, sort of the non-Eurocentric uh, theorists to try to counter that, uh, um, that, that approach. Uh, it is harder, actually they made it harder for us because now if you look, if you look at the global history all the non-Eurocentric presentations, um, they don't have a narrative. They don't have, they, they, they can't explain what happened in, in a sort of a global term. In, uh, um, they can't have an explanation of the rise of the West. Um, so they don't have a narrative for it. So until we come up with this narrative, I think the neo-Eurocentric like Beltings and Huff and others who actually worked on, on particularly bringing history of science into history of art or other fields, they still have the upper hand. Uh, it, it is a very complex um, uh, situation, and I, I would encourage people to engage with that article that I, that I present because I don't actually myself have answers. It's not easy uh, things to uh, 
uh, to come up with, and because they came up with a very robust argument, which is different to the old argument, but I don't think it's been picked up by uh, uh, art historian yet. Thank you. Very I don't know that that answer answered the question, but I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have Valerie Gonzalez. Thank you for your rich presentation about painting. I wonder if you are aware about the recent theory of the theory of Persian painting as writing, which implies a totally different manner of seeing the images as they are constructed in a mode well explained by Jean-Francois Lyotard in his famous text, Discourse Figure, when he writes, uh, I quote, at once discourse and figure a tongue lost in a hallucinatory scenography. I think she has a, um, a clarification later on. My point is that there exist recent propositions of explanations which offer responses to these questions uh, that are alternatives to these issues of perspective versus flatness. Um. Thanks, Valerie. Look, uh, I take your point. Um, I think, um, look, I, I haven't covered that area. I mean, I, I, I'm aware of it. I'm aware of the way that they're trying sort of um, um, to, uh, to address it. This is a sort of complex question. I still think that even um, uh, with, with Lothar, they're still, they're still thinking within, and also, um, so are they still thinking within the sort of, the fabrics of thought of the of European languages of that visual um, um, visual perceptions. Uh, I think I am still sort of searching to find my feet around this, but I haven't actually seen anything that will will um, sort of give me indication that that the the, the thinking um, procedures or the thinking processes to analyze these have gone beyond the linguistic foundations like you know for example the moment you continue to use the gaze and, and visual perceptions and all that you're still working within a, a particular fabrics of thoughts and uh, and I wanted to see whether whether someone started to actually look at the the Islamic languages in a, in a more um, uh, profound way analyzing the you know finding an analytical vocabulary that allow you to think through them rather than you know, assuming universal terms and uh, uh, and seeing that it applies everywhere in the same way, that could be the case. Uh, I might actually be um, on a sort of non-realistic project, but this is what I've been trying to chart in my in my current project. So uh, um, I don't have a direct answer to this. I, I don't think that I am you know, fully aware of the um, of of this aspect yet. But uh, um, but I'm more interested in the studies. That have tried to think in, in to think within the frameworks of the of the Islamic languages, rather than trying to come up with an analytical theories of the gaze or visual perceptions or representations. And I mean, even you know, when you talk about words of representation, it's very hard to actually find the uh, uh, find its equivalent in the fabrics of thought of Arabic. Thank you. And Avino and Shalem has a comment related to this. Um, uh, interesting, dear Valerie, it poses interesting question as to how picturing as writing refers to calligraphy. Um, and then there are, there are uh, uh, do you need another coffee? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I had my coffee. In the you had That's all right. no, I have on. another coffee. So Giada Vercelli, uh, thank you very much for a great talk. I could find an echo in Guru Nijibolu, critic to building, in particular the reference to Islamic art as appealing to the inner senses beyond the hierarchy of the five senses. I was wondering whether we can take the fact that many painters were also calligraphers and poets as evidence of this need to visually express a multi-sensorial approach. Um, you know, Gulu is a fantastic scholar and have actually done great work and her works on the, uh, on the gaze has been really inspirational to me. And one of the earlier texts that had actually inspired me to, to work on this and all, all her work uh, is fantastic. But it really, I mean, if you look at 
even though that she does convey those meanings, particularly talking about sight and insight and, and various aspects, she she still works within the within the um, the vocabulary of the gaze. Um, she has not actually she has not ventured out outside this. She has, uh, um, um, although she, she she attempted to describe. I think it makes it easier once you get out of the uh, out of the European language. I don't know if she if had she. You know, explored her ideas within the fabrics of the Turkish thinking. I think that would have been absolutely fabulous because then you would see the possibilities that the language presents. I think this. It seems that it is. Look, I'm. I'm not. A, uh, you know, the fact that it's calligraphy as a mode of writing, like a bit of sort of art or uh, uh, expressing uh, the sort of the beauty of the Arabic alphabet, is really not my the, the heart of my um, my project. My project is when I talk about fabrics of thought and the fabric, and I use the metaphor as fabrics of thought as being woven by language, then I need to see um, a set of terms and a set of writings and a set of sort of conceptualization that employs those in order to create that fabric. I don't think that Guru does that. Um, but having said that, I mean, Gulu covers the content very well and able to convey the, uh, um, you know, the, the way that the artist or the thinkers actually go beyond the sensory. But it makes better sense if you start seeing why do they do this? Because their linguistic apparatus forces them to think that way, because, because you can only think within your language. Um, uh, let's say if, if I'm trying now to think in a Chinese, a language that I don't actually know, it would be extremely difficult for me. Mm. Um, not difficult, it's impossible. So um, uh, I, could, I could work within the language that I am. I can work within the English because I sort of learned the English, even though it's a second language. Uh, I, could, I could operate better within the Arabic. Uh, I can operate with difficulties in Persians and, and, uh, and Turkish. Um, because I know Paro is not as good as Arabic. So it's, it's always, you know, the, as I said, it is not really the, the Arabic, the, the artistic expression of Arabic that, that interests me. I'm interested in the actual language itself and the way that enables us to think in certain ways. And I think when I call, I mean, in fact, uh, I just refer to one thing. When I, uh, when we were searching for publishers uh, for, th for this, um, one of the publishers that were interested suggested that I will take the word nazar out and you know, call the book Ways of Seeing. And, uh, mm. and I refused. I said, no, I'm not going to do it. And I didn't go with that publishers because it actually just undermined entirely the, the whole idea that I've been trying to present. Uh, which is moving from Ailen to Nazar, and there will be subsequent uh, subsequent uh, volume that will, will will deal with this. So without without Nazar, we could not actually, you know, as as I tried to to show, we could not present that a new perspective. Very interesting, uh, Asha Imam. Thank you for sharing your work. I found it very interesting. Look forward to your book. Uh, you mean, Zina, if we compare philosophically the notion of Islamic Nazar with the Greek notion of Logos, can we identify a starting point to reflect on the difference between this philosophy, language, lo logic, and aesthetics? Um, this is, we, we get here into some kind of a sort of a comparative studies and, and comparative linguistic is really um, um, interesting. I think looking at the comparison between Nazar and Logos would actually be quite um, um, uh, quite interesting, um, but I um, but it would it, it is a bit sort of a different project altogether. Um, it will definitely bring some insight because the Arab have used the um, um, the Greek sources early on in their in their translation, so they could. Um, um, it will highlight certain ways as how the fabrics of thought in Arabic has been mobilized or enabled um, by the Greeks. Um, and I could actually see, particularly in Kitab al Manazir, because, because if it came from Optos, which is the scene, then, and then uh, Ibn al Haysim was able to, to be faithful to the original sort of meaning. But the word has actually changed. Kind of topography in the in the medieval time it becomes optics and uh, um, so 
so definitely a comparative linguistic is, is really is really important and i think it would it would reveal an important aspect of the fabrics of sort of arabic but it would be actually a side project and uh, um, it would it would have it would take someone who can master the two languages to be able to do that quite well Ahmad Sukkar, impressive presentation as usual. I was wondering whether you could comment on how the spiritual aspects of Naza relate to the sexual aspect as presenting the discussion of Orientalism. I'm thinking of the cover selected for Edward Said's Orientalism, that is the snake charmer by Jerome. Oh gosh, the, yes. <laughs> the painting yeah. depicts a naked boy watched by a group of armed men. I think it's, it's, I mean, the issue of sexuality has very much uh, been um, the core of the discourse of the gays. And, you know, anyone who's familiar with Lacan, you know, sexuality is, you know, right at the heart of this. And in fact, if we look at Ahkam and Nazar, uh, it is all about sexuality and all about the way that the uh, male and female and the body, particularly the representation of the body has been, uh, uh, has been constructed uh, from the point of view of the rules concerning seeing. So it is, it, it is absolutely there. Um, uh, anyone who, who, who um, actually read Ahkam and Nazan, all the commentary on Ahkam and Nazan, all the, all the implication of Ahkam and would know that this is. Now, as it, as it relates to the sort of issue of Orientalism, um, and particularly the, uh, the snake charmers and, and all that, I think... Um, this now we're getting into the gaze from the Western perspective, because those are Orientalist paintings that are actually being done in order to represent the Islamic world in a particular way. Um, um, but uh, um, but it, is, it is not something that I've actually dwelled on at this stage. Um, uh, I'm, more, I'm, I'm more interested in the way that, uh, that the sort of the Arabs and the Arab scholars um, or the mystics or the philosopher or the scientists have actually explored the relationship between these three terms, which is Nazar, Basar, Ru'ya, because, because I think this gets obliterated by the concept of the gaze, even though when you, even though when you actually look at sort of issue of sexuality, you've got actually to look at those three terms and the way the dynamics, the relationship between the two, in order to understand how they thought about it in, in, his, in, in the Islamic world. So, um, um, yes, so the first part, the second part, I think is a little bit remote to my concern at this time. Mm. Zainab Tamasuki, thank you so much for this intriguing talk. I was wondering if you could elaborate more on your idea of languages, fabrics of thought that you used regarding the multiple languages in the Islamic world. Maybe you've answered partially this question. I understand that the perspective chosen in this book. However, I want to know if you consider limitations to your viewpoint. Does your idea merely refer to the term Nazar or relies on language in general? Look, I, I take this point. I think it's a very, very valid point. Thanks, Zainal. I think it's really uh, important. And as I, I said, the, the interesting that actually when you look at the contributions in the book, um, uh, for example, we've got uh, Always in the, in the edited book, depending on really the, the linguistic framework of the authors, like for example, Shaha um, uh, worked with the, um, with the Mughal painting, so she had to work with Persian. Um, so uh, she presented certain aspect of Nazar from the painting, uh, from the, uh, um, uh, from the um, sort of Persian perspectives. Um, and it's the same as um, the one that done by Sushma, also um, it, it's in the, uh, Sort of the in the Indian traditions, and uh, whereas let's say James he worked with Indonesia, and he looked at the whole issues of vision within the within the Indonesian language, uh, and the same as um, um, uh, Virginia who also worked on Indonesia and, and worked with the Indonesians. So you can actually see the sort of the repercussion or the the ripples, as it were, or I would say probably the uh, the, the the expansion of the concept in, in various languages. We did not have a contribution that would look at it. Uh, um, uh, I, I think I think Wendy Wendy Shaw also looked at it in the uh, uh, particularly in the Turkish, but and particularly with reference to the Rumi's work. Uh, but we didn't actually have um, a contribution that looked in the uh, in the person. So yes, the fabrics of thought, as I said, if it is, if I'm I stick to my position that it is woven by language, it would have to be in order to be 
fair to the project and to be sort of comprehensive, it would have to be taken into and, 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 and investigated in all Islamic languages. Um, as I said, the limitation, but because now you may actually then why did you stick to, to Nazar rather than sort of find another term? Now, Nazar is a Quranic term, and in, in fact, uh, it has been used extensively in the Quran, and so is Basar and Ru'ya. So because they are Quranic terms and has been widely used throughout the Islamic world within the Quranic context and within the within the sphere of the, uh, the Quranic meanings, um, I could be justified to use it uh, as such. Now, when we get into, and the same as the Ilm, um, when we start to use term that is not sort of supported by that kind of sort of universal text that, that kind of brings the Islamic cultures together, then yes, it becomes more problematic. There is a problem in using the word, but I think it is less problematic than choosing one that is so specific um, to um, a language like Arabic, but Arabic now is the language of education throughout the Arab world. And, and because, because it is being promoted through the Quranic text, I think I'm justified to sort of make it as standing for other variations of the meaning in various, in various languages, because there will be an adaptation of it in, in that language. Because they could not get out of the of the Quranic projections of the way that, and it's been used something like 150 times, and the same as Basar and the same as Ru'ya. So, and in fact, it's very interesting the way that the Quran actually presents the three together. I haven't referred to this, but there is a reference to that in the in the book. Uh, Abino Shalem has a, a, a point. He had to leave and says, thank you very much. Uh, but he says, Kurt Bat was a German art historian who argued for picturing as writing and viewing as reading, going back to the previous point. Uh, Amira Jalani, I would like to mention the words like uh, Mansur in Quran is different meaning in Quran, which means judgment day and also vision, which is Ruya, it means dream. It's true. Hi, Amir. Uh, look, um, um, I in the, in the spectrum of what I presented, um, I mentioned Rupya as a was a Ta uh, Marbuta and Rupya with um, with the Aleph, um, which is which are the sort of it shows. This is important because it shows that the, the, like you know normal vision, like you know a sensory vision and dreams are so connected because they are. Of the same, the only difference is that the, the final sort of emphasis on the and the same with Basar and Basira. So, so um, um, the, the the relationship between the terms. That is why I was talking about fabrics of thought because you know we've got to get into all this to understand how people have thought about it. Uh, you know, in English, you don't actually have sort of visions and dreams um, meaning this, you know using the same word. A, you know, you're starting to move into different. Sort of experiences or sensory experiences, whereas the Arabic does, and by bringing those together, it, it allows you to see that people would see the relationship between more, or that relation more transparent than trying to sort of construct it um, through theoretical means. I don't know whether I answered the um, um, uh, a day in Manzur, uh, which is the judgment day. Yes, that, that's that's just another addition to the uh, to the word of Nazar. Um, um, which yes, I, I, I would I would I would say that should actually be added in the way that that the spectrum of uh, of term that emerged from Nazar is, um, should be presented. I think it's this is the last question because you've been talking for over an hour and a half now. Uh, Karen, right. you know, <laughs> is there a presumption that Ibn al Haytham was widely read and applied uh, in medieval Islamic world? Was there no divide between scientists and artists? Um, that's Karen, that right? Yeah. Um... Look, I think there's a two side to this question, very important question. Um, Ibn al Haysam, kind of a universal sword that's cited by most art historians because it does refer to the aesthetics. Um, and particularly in the section that, uh, uh, in the section of his Kitab al Manazir, um, which talks about Idrak al Hassan and Idrak al Qubah, which is the 
the way that you perceive beauty and the way that you perceive ugliness. And there are no others, there are no other sort of um, texts that have that have sort of presented theory of aesthetics in the same way that Ibn al-Haysan did. But I agree, Ibn al-Haysan was not widely read. Um, and that is why one of my point of contention is that, that in order, many, many art historians try to rely on Ibn al-Haysan theory of aesthetics to try to justify certain things. And I always have doubt about this because there's no evidence that Ibn al-Haysan was widely read. Um, there are certain, you know, uh, several, um, um, in fact, I think in the, in the, uh, from memory in, uh, in the whole sort of eastern part of the Islamic world, like, you know, um, the Levant, Turkey, and Persia, and even the Turkey, there's only two manuscripts that's been found, two or three, I think two or three manuscripts, uh, and now kept in, the, uh, in Istanbul or in, in the libraries in Turkey, whereas um, there are several in the, in the eastern part, like, you know, in, the, in Spain, for example. So there's no evidence, that, you know, we don't have hundreds of, of uh, manuscripts to say, like, you know, this has been really widely read. So, so there's no evidence, of, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's an important work to see how the relationship between Nazar, Basar, and Ru'ya is actually being, uh, being conceived and discussed by, uh, by scientists. Now, scientist is not the right word, um, because I don't think that, it's a scientist is a sort of a modern term that refers to um, natural scientists or the scientists of uh, of nature or what used to be called natural philosophers, um, and and um, and I don't think that we can actually make a dis distinction between scientist and uh, um, an artist um, because I don't think they were scientists as such. But, but one of the things and that was actually brought up in uh, in the earlier book on Ayn, um by. Um, um, one of my students, uh, which looked at how ana anatomical drawings have actually been used in science book um, in order to, uh, um, in order to, um, because ana anatomical drawings are actually part of the developments of visualizations of the uh, of early modernity, and uh, and in fact the entire the entire book. Um, of Kitab al Manadu's seven volumes, there's only one drawing, it's sort of a cross section of the eye. Uh, and there hasn't been uh, a widely used anatomical drawings by, uh, um, uh, by um, uh, scientists or by people who actually worked with natural, um, natural philosophy. Um, but to what extent actually the, um, the, the artists have actually used the insight from those kind of natural philosophy book in their, in their um, representation, it, it is hard to tell. Uh, they, we don't actually have um, evidence that suggests that they have, they have used it, but there's no evidence that they have, that suggests that they haven't actually used it. Um, what I would say when we consider fabric of thought is to consider how those particular terminologies being used and put in operation widely across the society. Let's say, for example, Sufis, natural philosophers, and theologians, and even travelers and others. That are, the more you get to see how those three terms have actually played out in their way of thinking, and and of course reflecting their way of seeing, then we get a better picture of how the uh, sort of the artist and the uh, what we call scientists have actually worked together. But I, I don't think we can actually reduce it to that kind of polarity. It's very hard to to um, um, to document that kind of relationship. Well, Samir, thank you so much for, for your talk that has inspired such a wonderful conversation. And thank you also for answering all of them so comprehensively. You must be exhausted. Can we give him a round of virtual applause? Oh, <laughs> thank uh, you so much. <laughs> oh, thanks, Anna. That was really wonderful. And thanks for the, for the audience. It's been really um, great to see all. It's actually quite intimidating to see all those. <laughs> You know, uh, colleagues and uh, esteemed colleagues that uh, have taken interest in this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, so it's been it's been a pleasure. Thank you all. I can Good. go and actually have a nap now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Anna. Thank bye. you all. Bye. bye.